PC Cortina City, you're aboard Papa. And uh, tonight's episode's a double bill, double whammy. So that means double PayPal as double super chat has come on, don't be shy, it's two hours of fun. Chat amongst yourselves, and if you've not gone out and stocked up on drinks, well, I suggest you get out pretty quick and get yourself some extra beers for this one, folks. Strap yourselves in. It's going to be a big one. Hold on. I'm going in. I'm going to go downtown and check it out. Here's a tip for you, if you fit in a new fuel tank and your filler neck doesn't land exactly in the middle, I like them to be concentric. Stick a breaker bar in, or a broom handle, and you can just get it right in, and then you can just lever it, and it'll, it'll slightly bend to shape. This one is not far out. We'll live with that, I think pretty good just need to fill the cap now I'll get that on I don't want any muck getting in there and I'll love my clean tank gotta go and find a filler cap god knows where it is though could be anywhere fuel pipe goes on. Oh yeah. And now, Deep Reach 13, our oh, Richard Reach. Good idea, Rich. Good idea, boy. There you go, boy. There you go, boy. Good idea, boy. There you go, boy. Hell yeah. Evenly, very evenly, boys. Hell yeah, there you go, boy. There you go, boy. There you go, boy. A goal. I think that's it. I shall check. But that's the idea. We'll just check it seated all right. I might have to sometimes slacken them down, shuffle it, put them back up again, get everything to go right. But they do angle that way. That's why they pivot on there. I've seen some more parallel. I've seen some less parallel. But uh, bomf, you go. Well, I had a little break. There's the old shock absorbers, by the way. In the bin where they belong. And we were doing the tank and had an early break. But the uh, tank is in, tank is in. Just got to nip these bolts up here. It was a bit of a, a wiggle waggle getting that in. But it's in, and then we're ready to connect. Whoops, I, tra I trapped the fuel pipe. Be doing that. Yeah, that goes nicely there. Look, we need a little bit of fuel pipe and uh, connect that up. Some jubilees. Then I'll nip up these bolts. It's very early in the morning. Very quiet. Very peaceful. Very peaceful today. So we're to get on and nip up the bolts with a deep reach socket. Dead easy to do. 
deep reached because the bolt's quite long. They're nicely de-rusted. I showed you that the solution worked very well, but they have to go in for quite a while. Everything else holding out good. Wheel tubs look nice. We're all painted underneath. Shock absorbers on. And uh, good to go. Must admit, I never remember the shock absorber bolts being that far out there. But that's how they were. Interesting. Very interesting. And then we can move to the front. Start moving to the front. We're going to get the engine bay loom in. Because we need to be fitting the engine soon. I've ordered an exhaust. The Pinto unit, the overhead cam 600 unit, will be going in to get this car out and about. And then we'll begin getting the Kent rebuilt. Sounds crazy, fitting an engine and taking it out. But I just know my time scales and winter will come quicker than you think. And that sounds crazy. We're right in the middle of summer, but you've got to plan ahead. And if it, for any reason that Kent engine is delayed, I do not want this car stranded here in winter. It needs to be mobile moving and I kind of like looking forward to putting a Pinto in for a bit of practice as well remember we built the loom to take both alternator types so you know it's plug and play I'll get on fit this 13 deep reach socket and get that tank nipped up and then connect the fuel line through with any position to have a fuel line I should have a nice new filler cap for this somewhere in stores I'll go and dig that out if you recall we had the old fuel sender and the tank bolts in the de-ruster I'll just show you how bad this was de-rusters done its job there you can see that's come up a lot better certainly the terminals are like brand new so it's having a go, it needs to be in for a week, but even this is still heavily crusted up. It does flake off, but it was exceptionally bad. I mean, that would, that would eventually go. You'd probably just spray that down, put it in again, spray liberally. Um, totally flattened. Washer there. But here's the problem that's gone. You see that movement there? So that's had it. So that's really only good for parts. You can use the disc. That's the bit I'm holding. And unbolt the mechanism. If you've got one that's got a pitted disc, you could swap this disc out. And indeed this fill pipe. So this actually is good use for one that's damaged. Just swap the internals across. So it has got a use and it's good that that's de-rusted and cleaned up so again never throw anything away just put it into store so that's done but how do we get on with our tank bolts they were pretty rusty but they did all right there yeah, they're cleaned up there you go nice so the, that's that's rust x so you've got to leave it in a good while about a week really for it to do its job it's not an overnight thing but tank bolts survived completely intact reusable good to go back on no problem with those so there's nothing to stop me fitting the tank at all everything's on then i'll hook the fuel line up then i'll cross that job off the list and move to the front it's tools away clean up and see what work we can be doing at the front of the car okay i'm going to do the cam belt on this now just bring you around, camera coming around, camera coming around, there you go, I've got, he gone! So curiously, I noticed when I was just uh, rotating the crank, the engine doesn't move freely but it's locking at a certain point and I felt it being uh, the valve and then I looked here, the tensioner is already backed off so someone was either about to change the belt had changed the belt and not let the tensioner go back. Something's gone on. That tension is in the locked back position, so the belt was sloppy. So probably, what well, I've not done it, but whoever's to tried to check the engine, they might have done it. They may have pushed this back to turn the engine over to see if it was seized. I don't know. But it's locked in the backward position. That's the tension there. Anyway, regardless of that, we're going to have to carry on. I just hope 
that it hasn't uh, it's not a damaged engine i've got a hub puller on the bottom pulley and we're taking that off you've got to use a hub puller on these most of the time anyway okay that's going to come off i think uh, yeah camera can pick you up there sometimes you just got to check that the camera's in focus when you haven't got a cameraman so that's the pulley that's what you can use you just about get that in when you're on, in your car you might have to have the rad out to do it but i think you can you can do these at the side of the road if you know what you're doing but easier when they're out like this so we could just get it the last bit whoa <laughs> we nearly flew off there. right so we've got that we're going to take the belt off we've got that washer there which wasn't on before so they've not put that back on either i noticed that too someone's messing around and not getting it right in fact if i recall no there wasn't a pulley on this when i got the engine there was no pulley on it that's probably why that wasn't on i popped that pulley back on so i'm getting it to top dead center what you've got to do is there's notches on the that fly on that uh, crank timing wheel you might be able to see the notches you need painting white by the way there your timing light notches on you mark up your engine so that goes on on a key way so you can only get this on the crank one way because it's keyed that lines up with the marking on the casing of the engine curiously there's a bolt missing out of that as well so i've got a bolt missing there i'm gonna have to put that back in this is uh, looking dodgy yeah there's a bolt missing from that and what's what's been going on with this it looks like it's had rebuild work and they've not quite finished it anyway the um, once that wheels off that dish cup only goes one way it's dished inwards it goes on there dished inwards so it's scalloped out if it was a plate it's facing me okay so that's out then your belt comes out like this and that's the end of that if you fit in a new belt i always put the right in that way round start with okay my camera's got a mind of its own certain words turn the thing off belt on the bottom sprocket now you've got it exposed we now need to time up the distributor that's got a notch in it you should have and the rotor needs to point to not the notch over this the notch is just about very hard to see these notches but you've got a rotor arm here in this we're not going to use this distributor we're using an electronic one so go and get that now but you turn this wheel here that's the auxiliary sprocket that's the oil pump and the distributor you turn it till the, the rotor arm is pointing at the notch in the casting of the distributor some don't have it so i have to put the distributor cap on and look at number and pick number one it's normally from the front of the engine about two o'clock so you've got to, you've got to link in your distributor so the rotor arm's pointing to the notch in the distributor casing feed your belt in and then you're going to be we're going to be heading up this way there's um, a moon and mountain effect on the top of this wheel they call it moon and mountain because on your sprocket wheel at the top there is a little peak in the casing it's in the little backing plate and there's a dot punched into the cylinder head and what they want you to do is to line up the triangular or the peak of the mountain to the dot or the moon uh, the dot is stamped into the casting of the head you'll see it you need a torch to see it it's through here and I've got mine lined up it's a kind of yeah a very uh, symmetrical mountain and it points makes a pointer basically it's an arrow pointing to a dot it's in the cylinder head and that means that the the cap the timing cap the cam and all the valves are in the correct position for when the engines at top dead center you know you're at top dead center with a spark plug out and the piston will be on its upstroke on cylinder number one so you turn this crank till the piston's coming up on number one and you'll find that then 
the crank pulley wheel lines up with the notch in the aluminium casting. We need to paint those up. I don't think of any white paint. I'm going to have to do them in, in fluorescent. So I just need the distributor now. I'll be right back. Pull the distributor out. This distributor is in good order. There's no play in it. And a lot of the time you'll get play on this shaft here and you'll feel it in lateral movement. This is good. Is it a Bosch? It's a genuine Ford one. The bearings are really good on it. It's had new points. You can see those there. More evidence that the engine's been looked after, a new condenser as well, or at least a very clean can of a condenser, it probably is. But that's in good order. And the VAC advance is not perforated and works, they rarely do break, but that's a perfectly working distributor, there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's got um, the points would have to be replaced because they never like being left standing. But I'm just going to show you the timing mark, it's so faint. It's a little knot and it's just in the rim there. I mean, you can't even see that on the screen. Very faint. Now, I'm not using the mechanical. I'm just getting shot for you. I'm not using the mechanical uh, distributor, even though this one's in really good order. This will be sold on. Or you could keep it in the spares department. If you're doing a long distance trip, you always take some spares with you. You know, basic tools and such. If your electronic ignition unit ever went, you could always have a, a backup. You can always get these going even with a nail file when the points go. I've gone for the AccuSpark system for this engine. Two means, I had one in stock anyway, and I just like them. Uh, these are 80 quid and they're well worth it. 84 quid, although they've probably gone up now. I don't know if they were importing these, but anything that's I think I mentioned this before, anything that's coming in from abroad is like 50 quid more. And um, yeah. But I'm just going to see if there's a timing mark on this. It looks like they've put a bit of a. No, it's not even a red dot. No, nah, they haven't put a timing mark on this. I don't know why they don't do this. I thought I suspected such. If there is one there, it's faint, but I cannot see a timing mark. So they might ask you to point it to one of the screws as such. We could compare it with um, this one and line it up about the same way using the, the VAC as a reference point. It's just... I'm just looking to see their notch. There is, there is nothing there. I don't know why they don't do that. I'm going to make it life difficult by doing this. It finishes in this corner of the bracket that holds that on. So I'm going to mark a time and my own time and notch in this. Uh, just with some paint and then we're going to get on drop this in so that it's, it's pointing at the notch we'll just basically copy the notch off this all right simple as that put the rotor arm on this and just make it so both rotor arms are parked on the notch and that's it right uh we're going to slot that distributor in there then we're going to bring the timing belt up it's going to go up over this one first holding it under tension the best you can round and over the tensioner and back and then we can release the tensioner, crank the engine round a few times by hand, and then I think you can go four times round and then lock the tensioner in. It's locked back and round. When you undo the 13 and the spline, it pops out and that tensions the belt. And you flip round before you tighten back up and it just sets the tension, then lock. That's according to the Haynes. So we're going to do that. Then we should be all timed up on this. We can then start putting the oil in. But what I will do. I just remembered this, before I actually finally fit the belt, if you recall, we said we were going to spin round the auxiliary wheel to pump some oil up to the spray bar. It'll be easier doing it with the cam belt off because then we're not having to turn the engine round. So we'll spin this with a 17mm socket on the drill and we should get the distributor spinning round and once we've poured the oil in, we should get oil coming out of the spray bar. That's what I wanted to check. 
I'll be right back, we'll get on and do that now, but we'll first mark this up. Plenty to do then, let's get going. Okay, we're getting ready to put some oil in here. Here's another good tip for you. One from behind the engine. Um, where are we? Yeah, these flexi pipes you can get from Machine Mart, that's in the UK, Machine Mart. And they come with a filling jug, an oil filling jug, but also you can just use the spout straight onto the caught on the engine crane, straight onto the tub itself. So now we can fill straight into that oil galley. Can fill the engine. So I'm just going to give it a couple of litres at first. Yeah. There's a thick gooey oil there. Needs to get through to the good stuff. Actually, no, they're all clear. First two, third one. Oh, all those are clear. Certainly stored some gunky oil in its. Um, mix there didn't it because that's all clean oh, we should get clean oil coming out soon but at least it's got oil in it my drill died just when you need it most we'll have to give it a we'll have to give it a a charge on the drill but you see the idea that it's starting to become the clear oil now you can see the second camera and how it works so you get the two views on this film and that was the distributor see how that turns we can just put this on continuous so it doesn't do that but of course our drill is flat uh, see how that turns out. That's pumping oil out, starting to get clean now. We just need to charge this drill up. So yeah, there's a missing bolt. I mustn't forget that missing bolt here. They've not put it back in. I don't know why. I'm just trying to think if that bolt is not for the cam cover, is it? No, I think it is. I think it's just missing. So that's the uh, sprocket there, that's the cam cover, that's where you're feeding your belt in. So our belt goes in there, round this wheel, keeping it under tension, up to the top, keeping it under tension, it comes back on itself. You always keep it under tension as you feed it round. And then you'll get a slack area here, and that's where the tensioner wheel pops out and pinches that tight so the slack areas on the left hand side richard taught me that one that's it so that's what we'd be but we'd, we'd have all that set up there's that little arrow for pointing at the dot what they call the sun it's the mountain of the moon and then of course you have this lined up so that so that that is pointing to the the distributor is pointing to the marker there, which corresponds exactly with the cap. So it needs to be at least in line with one of the the cap uh, ports, you know, one of the cap terminals for the ignition leads. That's number one. It's not even marked on the cap, but that's the way it is. So. I designate that as, as uh, plug lead one. So when you clip that in, that rotor is exactly landing on that on that plug lead. So the spark straight across to one. It's on top dead center here. It's on the mountain and the moon line up there. And of course, the rotor arm is pointing to one. That's it. You can get it 180 out. So I just need to uh, ask how you do that. 
the piston has to be on its upstroke, the compression stroke, not about to go. I'm just trying to think if there's two revolutions per piston movement. I just need to check that. It always gets me this bit of the video every time. See you in a sec. Okay, I've got, uh, as I said, got the cam belt on. I'm just doing the valve clearances now. So, yeah, we talked about getting that distributor set right. Of course, cam belt on. But I did spot a loose follower. This is a follower, cam follower. And it shows some impact there. And indeed, on the lobe, we've got a gouge here. There is a gouge. I don't know what's caused that. It was loose though. I mean, it was like 0 0.5. The whole thing wasn't even tight. So that would have been a trouble. That would have been a rattler for sure. <clears throat> I've gone through the rest of them. Clearances using feeler gauges. You've got 0 0.25 mil on your exhaust clearance. And you've got 0 0.2 on your inlet. This one was way out. Now, the actual follower is okay. It's not destroyed. It's not the best, but it's not destroyed. So I can put it back and set the clearance on this. Now to do the clearances, you use your feeler gauges and these are metric ones. So you have to use 0.2 or 20.20 mil and 0.25. The exhaust ones, they're all on this side course because it's the exhaust side and they're the 0.25 clearances so what you do you turn the crank you can do it in pairs till the lobes upright so that's the clearance it's not supposed to be touching the follower at that point then you put your slide your feeler gauges in until it just drags on the gauge if it's loose and what you do you get the crow's foot which is here this is a crow's foot spanner see why they call it crow's foot and it goes in on a locking nut at the bottom then there's a 15 on the ball stud the ball stud is what winds in and out to adjust the clearance it actually pushes up on the follower and will close the gap between the follower and the cam so what you have to do the combination of the the uh, crow's foot there and a 15 on the ball stud you wind it either in or out to increase or decrease the clearance. Drag your gauges through again until it just feels right. Then lock the two together. The trick is to try and lock back that nut with a crow's foot without winding in the 15. So you kind of have to hold the 15 or the ball stud with a spanner while you tighten up that one. Otherwise the whole lot starts to turn and you lose your clearance again. That's the annoying thing. I don't like doing that. But it um, takes a bit of practice. Richard's an expert at it. I'm getting better each time I do it. So that's it. And you've got to do it for all. Eight, two, four, six, L, eight. On that. But that would have been a mess. That would have been really bad. It was all just wobbling loose. This would have just... That's probably why it scored it, to be fair. That's probably bounced all over the place. What it'll have done is it'll rock like this. And that's what scored it. So really, if it was a in a concourse machine, if it was in a if it wasn't going in pap, I would probably say it needs a cam. Even having said that, there's nothing wrong. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a big deal, and I'm not trying to do any botches, of course. But we've got to go with what we've got. It'll be interesting to see if that does create any rattling noises. But the pad on the follower is okay. If it was really, really bad and rusted, I'd, I'd be changing it. But it's shiny. There is a scratch on it, but I think it'll be okay. The rest of them are all right. This is the last one to do. So I'm going to lock back this spring, which holds the follower onto the ball. You can see why it's called the ball stud. Look. That's why. And that's why it's important that the spray bar spray liberally is working good because the spray bar makes the oil keep these cons consistently continuously lubricated up spray liberally then brace yourselves 
Okay, I'm going to lock that back together with those combinations, as I said. And then that is that area done and ready for a gasket. Clean this face up. I've already cleaned it up anyway, but I'll just wipe it back down. A little bit of staggy seal and then drop the cam cover on. Then I think that is it. I can put the cam belt cover on. I've got a cam belt cover as well. This didn't come with it. I got one from Jumble. And then I believe it can go back in the car. Once it's on the crane, there's the crane, we can put the flywheel back on. I've cleaned the flywheel up, it was a little bit rusty. Not scored as such, no deep gouges in it, there's some pitting, but that'll be okay for the friction plate. There's no gouges and that feels good all the way around. If there's deep scratches there, we'd be getting another flywheel or get that re-skimmed. Not many people doing that service these days, they are out there. New clutch is ready, we've got a brand new clutch, we won't be using this one. 600 clutch is different, splines are smaller and you get more springs on the 2 litre one. Genuine Ford clutch there, no point using those, you get all that in the kit. So that would be, that engine mounts need to go on, we need a PCV valve, this hasn't got one, there's the catch can. That's the breather catch can that takes the fumes out of the exhaust crank case and sucks them back into the inlet manifold and burns them away. Or part of your emissions control. It's going to need a tube from the catch can that goes onto the PCV valve. It's a one-way valve. And then it goes into this connector here. I'm going to have to blank that one off. I haven't got a single outlet one. This didn't have a connector on it at all. So I found one in stores, but it wants that end capping off. That end could actually be used to measure our vac on the Krypton, so we'll put a tube on it with a blanking nut at one end. We can use that for tune-up. Anything else? Anything else? Water hookup point is okay. Mast uh, brake servo hookup is okay. We've got an electric cut-off solenoid here. That'll need a 12 volt to it. That's uh, anti-run-on solenoid, stops the car from running on, kills the fuel. And uh, what else? Cable, accelerator cable's okay. I put an adapter ring on this, it didn't have one so that we can fit the air cleaner. It didn't have the adapter for the Ford air cleaner. I've got viscous fan on. I've got a viscous fan spanner, we'll need that later. We'll put the fan on when it's in the car. I think that's it. A stud to go into the exhaust. We've got a stud. Chris is our stud. We've got a stud. I think that's it. We can put it on the crane. Dangle, dangle on the crane. Get Bramble out. The Bramble dangle out. Push Bramble back. And then have to handball the car up to the uh, roller shutter here. And then I'm going to be offering the engine up into the bay. I'm thinking I can do it on my Todd, on my own. Should be able to. If not, ask an adult to help. We shall see. Then once it's in the bay, we can then start commissioning it up in the bay. Wiring and such. And get some fuel to it and see if it fires up. Start my... I'll tell you what, whoever fitted the exhaust manifold gaskets did a botch. I just never bothered cleaning these up, these ports. You can see they've been putting paste on there. Probably what they've done, they've already had the manifold off. They're not clean the faces and just pasted it up. So we're going in and cleaning it up. Because that's what it needs. See you what's worth a punt. Taking off the thermostat housing because it's so easy to get to at this stage it's only a gasket we've got plenty of them you may as well have a little look and just see the state of play on the thermostat because what you wouldn't want after all this is overheating on us when we get in on the road it looks like a good start it's clean it looks all right in there too. It looks all right in there, and the jacket itself 
we're all right in there too. Just medium. Well, no, it's pretty cleaner than average, really. So that's okay. I'll put another gasket on that. Uh, this firm start. That start. Did you catch that? I've got plenty in. That looks like it's been replaced. Hmm. I'm going to see if we can just find one. That's an 88 start. 88 degrees start. I can see it stamped on. The temperature... The wax bulb temperature is just on the tip there. And that's 88. <clears throat> so that um, firm set housing's in good order. They can often corrode. It's starting its little journey of corrosion. You can get them from Burton's, by the way. They're billeted, but they work. Well, I did have one separate on me once from Burton's. They're actually two part assembly. Going to get a gasket for that, and then I'll put a new start on if I can find one. We also need an alternator bracket. There's the engine mounts going on, because it had those mounts and one missing from the other side exhaust on. We need a stud from that exhaust manifold. So got to get that out. I need two nuts to lock together and undo the stud. I'm nearly there. It's a good job to check that thermostat really because um, this is the rubber, the condition of the rubber that holds the thermostat housing in. Boom, gone. Luckily, we've got another one in. We've got a gasket as well. The stat itself, I thought these were the right ones. I've got these in stock, but these are not correct. So we're stuck with the original stat. I'm going to put it in some boiling water. It should open, set for 88, so we'll go and test that now. I've cleaned the inside of that, ready to receive this. The ring goes here. What would have been happening with this is water would have been getting past it. This engine would have just been running too cold. Um, and this is what happens. These, If these sit idle and you don't use your car much, they just go brittle. So I've seen that happen when you stand the car for just a year and those just disintegrate. Especially if you've not got your correct mix of uh, antifreeze in there. It's a problem, the cars just don't like being laid up. I think it just starts to seize up on them. That's why I try and rotate all the cars as much as I can. But even my, some of my cars haven't moved for six months, so what can I say? Anyway, that goes into the housing like this. It's on that rubber gasket, this little clip goes on top, the whole shebang goes onto the block. It's a good job we checked it. So I've cleaned the end to receive the hose as well. They can get a bit crusty, so that's clean, ready to receive it. I've got new hoses as well. That goes over to there. Clean the face as well. You've always got to clean the, the, the ceiling face, the cylinder block face. So that cylinder, uh, that, backwards. That housing can go on. It's gonna have a, an Eccles cake. Now it's time for an Eccles cake break. I've even found some hose clips, hoses, jubilees. Let's go and have a little break. We'll be right back. We need an alternator bracket now as well. It's, do you know what? It takes longer to find the parts than to do the work. See you soon. So what would have helped if eBay had sent the right uh, cam belt? They sent me a two metre one, idiot. It's gone on motor factors and got one. Gates one, so we're okay. So fed in there. I'm just put the pulley back on now. That little dish cut. That's back on. And then you do that sort of half twist test. We're going to let the tension off now by releasing the 13. Stop me if you've seen this one before. Stop me if you're a Pinto race builder and you're saying Pete's doing it all wrong. Well. I've managed so far on all the other cars. I think I've got better each time at this. Until one day, you might even get it right, boy. See, the thing is, I don't know if they could handle it if you got everything right. Uh, the, the letters on my hand stand for Bruce Dickinson, BD for Bruce Dickinson, because I didn't want to forget a particular song I just heard on Planet Rock. So, we're on that now. We should rotate without any interference. This before the 1600 engine is an interference engine, and that is that the valves will hit the pistons if the um, 
cam belt snaps. That's because the deck here is a bit low, uh, lower. But this should turn. It wasn't turning before because the belt had slipped, the old belt. It's nice and tight that now. The old belt had slipped and um, probably spun round. I think they were testing the, uh, the engine before they sold it on eBay. This should rotate all the way. If it doesn't, then there's something wrong. So this should just go up nice and freely all the way around with no valves. Oh, right, we've got valves hitting, so something's wrong. There's no way that's turning. Something's definitely wrong. We shall have to investigate. We need to bend a valve, definitely something out. Can't see me being 180 out there. So I've never had that happen before. The, I can feel a valve hitting the piston. I cannot see it being anything else. I really can't. Um, let me see, unless I'm 180 out on that to that, that's the only other possible explanation, but I thought I did have it on the compression stroke then. The only other thing to do now is just take that to the next top dead centre position and redo it. But I was sure, I was sure that was right. But it's definitely bottoming it out. Yeah, it's locked out. It'll go the other way, but it'll not go that way. Well, it won't go that way either because it's now locked together and the bolt will just undo. We'll be right back. Let's go. Okay, we have loosened that and let the tensioner flip back. I'm now locking it in position after I've done four rotations before I do lock it. So I went around four times. I won't do it again. Just go around once. And then that is right there, nice and tight that side. You've just got to match everything up. And then we'll check that our rotor lands in the right place. We can move it to a degree or less. One more. And this, that's locked up. That 13 is tight on the, t on the tensioner wheel. Because the idea is you preload the tensioner wheel out of the way under spring pressure. That's the spring on it. And you lock it out of the way under its own pressure. When you're ready to use it, you release it with a 13 that flips back and that tensions the back of the belt. And as we said, we've got those alignments. Let's just go back and make sure we're parking okay. So I'm going to look for my top dead centre position again on the wheel. It's going to land just coming up now. Using my thumbnail there to just guide myself. So this should be the star. Well, that's the 180 out because this works how the hell have i done that this works can be 180 out so at the moment it might have a top dead center there it works on two top dead centers i can never remember how to do it now you can get it 180 out but i can't remember the way that you do it how do you know which one's which i think it's because Two have to be shut, they've got to be closed. Cut all that whole clip out. Okay, I'm just going to release, or I have released, the tensioner wheel. The belt tensioner, and I've locked it back in place. Now, I went round with it loose four times on the 19mm spanner. So we lock on there, we go four times round, and then when you're happy, you tighten it back up. Tighten that 13, and you tighten that little spline. The idea with a wheel is it's pre you preload it back. You've got to use a pry bar or lever bar. I use this lever bar here. And lock it back in position out of the way while you're fitting your belt. And when your belt's on, you release the bolt and it flips out under spring pressure. Then you turn the engine over a few times with the spanner, then lock it in position and it locks everything nice. That's done. Also, you can get the cam 180 out, and I've done that in the past. At the moment, the mountain and the moon, as we call it, is on the bottom, the dot they've lined up. But you can have um, 180, uh, top dead centre here, with this at 180 out. So the way to check it is to make sure that 
when that's at the bottom this top dead center pistons at the top because the valves on the next top dead center rotation because this only turns half as much so that's the next turn now these valves are beginning to open for it's an inlet stroke so if you had it the other way that's now at the top so they have got to match up okay you can get them out the wrong way so when this starts to turn now it's letting uh, um, it's an inlet so it's drawing in air and then it's compressing it now this is a compression stroke that's exploded actually that's an exhaust no it's not that's a compression stroke now coming up so it's compressing it I'm watching the valves as I turn and it's going to ignite it it should be ignition stroke and then exhaust that's exhaust now So it's blasted it out now this should be a, a suck in so this would be inlet opening which it is inlet on number one is opening to draw in air air's drawing in it's finished drawing the air in it's going to now start compressing the air both valves will close in a sec both valves shut this is now a compression stroke coming up coming up and that would be top dead center that'd be your ignition now so we'd now want this distributor to be in firing one good news the cam belt is on would help if they didn't send me a 1600 uh, two liter cam belt put it on and it was slack i thought that's not right 122 teeth instead of 119 wrong so we've refitted it so i'll just go over the procedure again because that threw me having that belt missing but we're all good uh okay so what we did we parked the the little um mountain and the moon so the moon the dots punched into the head there's a dot punched into the head and on the wheel that rotates they've made it a little mountain shape or an arrow and that arrow goes round and, and points at the dot once a revolution so that pointing at the dot is both valves on piston number one fully closed. In other words, that's the gas compressed, ready to make a detonation. So that's the what's called top dead center. That's where cylinder one fires. You can tell you've got that position right because the cam has, is lobes are, are, are flat. Both valves are shut on one. And you know that because if you look in the where the, pit, where the spark plug would go you can see as it's approaching top dead center the pistons on its way up and the valves are clo have closed so it's compressing the gas if it was on the exhaust stroke coming up the exhaust valve would be open so you know that you're right there the top dead center here at the bottom is of course on the push up stroke and that lands on the top dead center notch which it is so you park that there park that there i've cut the old belt off your, your bottom wheel your bottom pulley wheel that's off you've used your hub puller on that and you've took that off you put some co copper slip back on to help in the future so it doesn't seize on they've got to have it of seizing on especially the sprocket at the back so you put that back on with the belt now fed in on the first sprocket the little sprocket here in the alley casting you then bring it into the teeth of this one making sure that the distributor here is cam uh, so the distrib distributor arm is pointing to when you put the cap on it it's going to be pointing to where ignition lead number one is going to be which in our case it's bang on in line I i've marked that any of those could be one if you wanted but it's it's best to have one up this end 
it's usually around if the engine if you walk looking straight down the line of sight of the engine and the top of the engine is 12 o'clock that's pointing to about just past two o'clock because it enables you to twist the distributor to change sd cards then little gap there in the video yeah so this is pointing towards number one but you're best having it around the two o'clock position because then when you set your timing you have to twist the body of the distributor to suit your timing and you want to make sure you've got equal amount of play on that so you're in the midway zone if you if you set it too far towards the block you'll run out of room to twist the dizzy so they tend to park it up where it's got room to twist and either way so that would be number one there that can click on and that's that's ready to fire I've now locked the distributor down it has a little it has a little clamp here which you use goes that way I think I never remember, I never remember which way around those go I think it's that way yeah it is it's got a step on it so I'm gonna just clamp that down it has a little step that picks up on the rim of the distributor easy to get that the wrong way around I'm just making sure that it's not cross threading on me I'll be around this area that's okay so that's that we'll be, be adjusting that later that's parked there I never really liked the way that they have this cable in that position really this electric cable should be coming in from the back because you couldn't park this the other way round because your back thing would be in the way this is really quite tight it's in the wrong place in my opinion on this AccuSpark unit I'd like that at the side it's stupid having it that way I mean I know it's to go straight to your coil but to me it's not a good design that was but the units themselves are good so you've done all of that and then what happens then you can just turn the engine we're free to turn the engine's very easy to turn over by the way and everything everything works you're on fixed lens i'll bring you around i'm going to rotate the camera now on the tripod okay we are now cleaning out the core plugs i've pulled the cord, pulled out the core plugs smack them out i was leaning across the camera to show you a core plug that's gone just a screw screwdriver punch through keep it around this circumference keep it around the edge where the strength is flip the lip and you're good to go and now we just need to clean out the remains that I'm Keep your eyes on the wheel, your hands upon the road. Keep your hands on the wheel, and your eyes upon the road. On the road and your hands <laughs> upon the wheel. <laughs> okay, okay, lemon. Smoky, okay, okay. Lemon, smoky. I don't think you need sealant on these. So really don't. Well, we should put sealant on anyway. <laughs> If I put sealant on anyway, I don't think it'll be needed.
I really don't. I'll just put it on the leading edge and it'll just drag it in. Most of that's just going to get wiped off, so what is the point, man? Keep your eyes on the road and your hands up on the wheel. Hey, I ain't going. It's gonna take some force. I'm gonna slide in the middle. No, I cannot get that one. And we'll do a technique to this. I've seen people have an insert on these. It's gonna die. No. No. Just going on the inside, absolutely shocking. Bye bye. back on after clean up we have to take it off to get the core plug a little bit of paste on there new gaskets clean up just a touch of paste down copper head rule Hell yeah, down Copperhead Road, my hood's brewing up some real good whiskey. Yeehaw, the Copperhead Road. Yeehaw. Okay, finally getting ready to put some more finishing touches on the engine before we wheel it out. It's going to be going out pretty soon on your screens, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, in YouTube and Patreon land, it's going to be going out pretty quickly. Oh yeah, hell yeah. I've just put on the inline fuel filter, fitting the R6 fuel hose, new filter to go on. Got that for a couple of quid at a show recently. We should be good to go for the show. And uh, now, little seven to tighten them up. Oh, and we've got the air filter brackets made as well to hold this air cleaner box. I've made them because it didn't have any. Whoa, you're good to go. Oh, you're good to go. Okay. Right, that's nice and secure. Our, our input hose is in the bay, so we don't fit that. That's ready, so that part of it's done. This fuel line can go away. So this is 
Um, what do we call this now? 25 bar, is it uni 25? It's fuel hose R6 anyway. Petrol, new petrol proof ish. Never really know if it is or not, do you, with this new fuel? <coughs> Gotta try though. So, brackets are just outside, but they bolt to here and here, and they hold this down on them clamps. They're probably a rare item, those actually. There's an adapter in here which you have to buy, you have to buy for this. This is a new Weber card they've obviously bought for the engine. And I have to put that adapter ring on it so that it would fit this hole here. It was, um, without the ring, it was too small. You didn't get that seal onto the rubber washer. That seal's on there. Now we've got a bracket outside just being painted. Fits there and at the back. We've got the vac line for the oil catcher in and the oil catcher PCB valves in. That pipe comes nicely up there. That's vac pipe, slightly different than the fuel pipe. Bigger internal diameter. Then a blanked off piece because I only got a double T. I have no single T's. So we just blank that up with a, a bung plug. Can use this for connecting the um, Krypton for the uh, the analysing of the vac. We've got this pipe here just for now to a fine one. This is an advanced and retired pipe. It'll probably get replaced with the right pipe. I just can't find one of those at the moment. It's still a, a vac pipe. It'll work. Stop it. So let us set it up anyway. You know we're going to have to set that up with that. So there's not much reason having it in here now. We really need to put this on the crane. And then let's just take off. You're coming off the tripod now. Stay, stay focused. Crane's there. We've got to wheel this outside. I think I can do this. I have to move Tina G back. I'm going to have to handball Papa into position. I'm going to try and fit this on my own. I've got the clutch to fit, but that's about all. There's an alternator as well, but it looks like we might be short of an alternator. Brackets on for it. Exhaust you saw. Distributor leads will do in the bay. Air filter won't go on while we're putting the engine in. There's a new oil filter to go on. That's just I'm going to run it and dump the oil, then start again. Dipsticks in. I've secured the dipsticks, they always wobble. I've secured that with some peg tanky at the bottom. Seems to held it quite nice. They always pull out those dipstick tubes. Here's the other fixing point for that air filter. There's that T piece. I think that's all we can do. There's nothing else to do in here. Water pumps on. I did find the stat working, I put it in boiling water. That's had a new gasket gone on, and that's fixed, because that would have been that would have been leaking. Not leaking, but just letting water pass through because that O-ring seal had gone. You'll find that a lot in cars that stood still. There's nothing to stop us putting this onto the engine stand, onto the engine crane, then fitting the clutch and flywheel. I think that's the next job. Then have it hanging on the crane and we're going to try, let's have a look what we're going to try and do. What we're going to try and do is put Papa about here. The crane's going to come down. The only thing is I've got a ramp there, so that's going to mess me. And we need to get the crane so that it's, it's grounded out wherever that lands and then offer Papa up. So Tina G will have to push back, roll back. Papa comes back into here and then we'll just keep on going. I'm going to have to put um, a jack under the transmission, jack under the, uh, the gearbox to get it to... They want the gearbox pointing right up against the bulkhead. So when the engine comes in, it's not having to to seek it down and, and search for it that way. So um, I think I'm getting ready for this, yeah. Wish me luck, I'm going in.
get it airborne we're lined up we're going airborne we've got to take it off that stand any second now yep it's now clear of the stand so i'll get in and i shall unbolt i need 13 mil now for this and then it's going to be hanging there like that then we can put the flywheel on the back and get the clutch lined up It's 46 pounds according to the book. This is where we consult the manual. So I've set for 46. This is a torque wrench. We've got a lock. The flywheel. It's a two-handed job again. You want to try pod so I'm locking and I'm I'm locking and I'm talking up. I don't know. That last one to do. I'm going diagonal. I think that one's in now. I think these are all set. Just slot there, but that one's in as well. They're all set. I've also got to torque down the, the cover, but before we do that, we're lining ourselves up with a clutch tool. This is the clutch alignment, basically a pin. You could use a shaft off an old gearbox, but this you pick out of the kit different sizes to suit for a Cortina. We're using this one, and that's a taper end on it, and it goes into the spigot, which is in the end of the crankshaft. It fits in it like that, it's conical so it doesn't you don't lose it, you can draw it out so it's a cone shape. And the same on here is a cone shape, so it goes that fitting goes through there. Because it's a cone shape you can draw it out. Then that goes into there. That slides down and that enables you to centralise the clutch because it's got to be bang on in the middle when it comes into the engine into the gearbox the gearbox shaft is going to want to go straight through you don't want this out of line so that's why you use these and with that on you can now fit this onto the unit like so and now when we nip these bolts up I think they are <coughs> torque settings for those we need as well we'll get them in the clutch section of the book 25 or something 12 to 17 clutch to flywheel bolts 12 to 17 foot pounds so go down back down 22 this actually doesn't go that low, so it's on a very low setting. So I need to be there. And then a 13 would be required. And then the rest of the bolts, which are just here. These are the flywheel bolts. Now you can, if you want, use a bit of thread lock on them, won't do any harm to do that. So we'll get on and fit these. That's the five apes. The flywheel bolts are actually five apes. So yeah, so we're all we're all looking good there. So that's how you centralise your clutch. 
quite a neat little job nice new clutch I don't think the clutch friction plate matters which way it goes round I've tried to see if it's orientated I can't tell it doesn't look like it so I'm gonna have a break for dinner and then Smokey's gonna give me a hand come on come on come on come on you look like crimpoline lad you look like you've been the hairdressers you know his first crimpoline you look like you've been the hairdressers lad oh 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 seen a sec I just helped it along a bit then by the way I'm not using air tool to talk up, don't worry, before anyone says. You just used an air tool to talk it up. No, no, no. I use it to take a lot of the threads down at the same time. Might get rained on actually. It looked like it was going to be a clear day today, but looks like the rain's back. Opposite sides all the time. 12, 6, 3, and 9. That's it. That's one click and a, a quarter to That's it. And that comes out like that. So that comes off the end so you can put different adapters on the end. So we should be lined up there. Like so. In and in. That's the clutch, we've got a new release bearing as well. So we can get the engine back up in the air. Right, we've got this dust cover to go on. That's a bit tricky, you've got to sort of thread it through and get it in the right place. Which is a bit strange because I don't think that's the right dust cover. It's not lining up. Maybe it is. It lines up everywhere here. It lines up there. It just doesn't line up on the stuff. Oh, it's crushed. It's okay. It's crushed. I've got it. It's time to move the mountain to Mohammed. Engine there. We just do what we did in ancient times. Sheets. The Romans did it. The Egyptians did it. Everybody's a fruit and nutcase. Everybody's a fruit and nutcase. <laughs> Okay, lining it up there, it's just a little bit of clearance needed to get it over the arms of the crane, the subframe of the car hits it. I'm going to use a jack to do that. I've cleaned up the fork, it was filthy, it's come up very clean, so degreased that and we've got a new release bearing. So these can go in the bellows and clean the bellows in, already jet washed it out of course, but some leaves in there, we'll get them out, get this in. Well, 
here we are again Wilson you don't have to do a thing just hang on all you gotta do is hang on Car's got to come forward. There ain't enough reach. Okay, we've got to get this a little bit more forward yet. Can we do it? I'm hoping that when it comes down, it, the arm does go slightly forward, you see. That's what I'm hoping for. I've got it on very slow release. Crane that's stopping it. <laughs> a little cat taking up residence there. Beginning of a new week. You saw me doing the engine, it went in okay. Got it in the end. Just a little bit of a look at that wiggle. So a new coil goes on. That comes with the kit for the uh, Aki Spark. That fuel filter there in up to the carb. We had some rain, so I had to block off the carb in case it got water in it. Uh, I was an alternator short because the Kent alternator is a right hand fit. I needed a left hand fit. I had this unit and the brush pack's gone on it. Now there's a little bit of life left in the brushes, but I think this was off Ruby. Uh, for some reason I didn't, I didn't worry to exchange it, but the, that brush pack comes off at the back and get a new one. But this gets the belt on didn't have a belt this is a slightly thicker belt I've found it should work for now and the other thing that was wrong with the alternator is the nut had spun the threads had gone uh, on this nut so that's now a permanent repair it's welded on tightened it up till it's just started to slip then I've welded it to the shaft and then I've welded the pulley to the shaft so if it wasn't quite torqued up at least the pulley locks to the shaft the alternator was scrap anyway so there's nothing to lose you never know with a brush pack we might be able to that might go forever because you hardly ever take the pulleys off them so ah talking of that which that spins that spins oh dear so we've got freewheel on the oh no what am i on about the belt's not tight it's turning the whole lot We're okay it's turning the whole lot it's turning that it's just because i've not tightened it up yet uh. Yeah, I thought I'd nip that up pretty tight because when I nipped that up this you couldn't turn it so it was locked on It's actually not a lot of torque on that fan But um Could even get the welder at the back of it and just put one tack on it if I had to But it saves getting another alternator I think it'll be okay. I've never, I've never had to take one of them nuts off for a long time I usually spin them off with an impact gun Something had gone wrong with that years ago, so I don't know. But anyway, at least it gets us this. I think we'll, with a brush pack, we'll get that alternator back in the game, to be fair. Because the rest of it's all good. It's done only done about 5,000 miles before it failed. For some reason, I didn't warranty check, exchange it. Something probably came up. Anyway, we digress. We've got the water cooling system to put in. I've took the heater box out because we've got it. I'm not going to 
retrofit that heater box it's just going to wreck it i'm going to leave it as a, a piece of object dar. i've got another heater box to go in slightly chipped but at least that's got the heater divert flap in it look at all the crud behind there this is why they rot folks that's exactly why they rot on the bulkheads look and there's not much you can do to get that out except you could leave the heater in and get compressed air right in at the back and you would eventually get that without taking your heater out but i think it's worth taking your heater box out if you can without damaging it just to clean that up and get wax oil in there because that's you can see how that just holds the moisture look all those leaves and we found an artifact a piece of bone and that's not recent so that'll be something to do with guana how does a piece of bone get in there the marrow gone of course so someone i wonder if I wonder if Andre's family had a dog at some point. That's a dog bone. So the owner probably was a, had a pet. Well, how would a dog bone get down there though? Wow. Amazing, isn't it? The wipers are seized, so I'm going to take them off. I noticed when the ignition was on, the wiper was cooking. The wiper switch was jammed in the down position and the knob missing. That had been snapped off. So that was caused this to cook up. Because uh, I've had the ignition on for a bit and I smelt burning and uh, we could have knackered this. This could have gone. Hopefully it's salvaged. I got it in time. I don't know. We're going to have to take it off and free the mechanism up. Wipers are seized. Or the motor seized. I would say the wiper linkage is seized more than anything. We'll get that freed up in a minute. Um, it's not as important as getting the engine running. But it's just I want it off the, off the list. It's a viscous fan on this one got a viscous spanner there later engines viscous fan I'm trying to think if there's anything else hopefully i've done everything on the engine exhaust to connect up batteries charged i've got another battery as well ready starter motor's repaired it's fixed itself that uh, bulldog's got in and um, we're now we're now cranking we can now crank the car look for the first time my hand on the key so we're heading that way we need fuel we're getting a spark as well check for that we've parked that at position number one on top dead center so that's ready don't know about the carburetor situation i've connected a positive feed to the shut off solenoid it needs that on these ones the anti-run on solenoid later again all the vac hoses are hooked up so we should be good there. Once fuel gets in, it should fire. Need to connect the exhaust so we don't want to annoy anyone with the noise. I'll probably just let it fire up very quickly. There's no water in it. Really, we should have water in, really, you know. If it's you put the radiator in and there's something wrong with the engine, it's all got to come out. But you're either going for it or you're not. So I probably will install the rad now. So that's where we're up to. Uh, I thought I had a fan belt, I'd ordered one off eBay, not turned up, so that fan belt will just have to work for now. It is the wrong width. It's the right length, but it's the wrong width. It's a motocraft one, that makes no odds, of course, but yeah. And then um we should be going. I'm going to have to link out the heater matrix. No, I may as well, I may as well, tell you what I'll do, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will fix the wiper linkages and put the heater box back in and put the matrix in. There's no point uh, putting a link pipe on there. You may as well just do what you're doing. We need to get Henry in, hoover out all that crud, put some rust killer down there, and I'll just I'll just hand paste some grease in there. Uh, and that'll be better and longer lasting than uh, the wax oil. No, no harm in doing that. Um, need to take them closing plates off and just have a look at the state of play behind the bulkhead before we we do any more well, we're running slightly ahead of the game so we can afford time to do that i think that uh, we'll be okay now the clutch interesting one on the clutch the clutch adjusters right at the end i've had to pack it out with two bolts you can just see straight down below the exhaust it, there was no movement left the cable would come right to the end of its adjuster i think uh, from what paul Paul Zuni's told me that the thrust bearing there's different sizes and it could be that the Kent engine the way that it's designed goes further into that bell housing because really you've got an unusual combo here you've got an overhead cam 
in a 1600 Cortina Mark II gearbox. Why is it a Cortina Mark II gearbox? Because it's got a bench seat. Um, even though in the book it lists it as gearbox type D, I think. So it's showing in the Haynes manual and it shows in all the four books that gearbox was a Mark III box, but I think it's derived from the Mark II. And I think that whenever you had a bench seat, you probably didn't have an overhead cam engine. You probably always had a cross flow. And I think, I might be wrong, that the Kent cross flow engine goes slightly deeper into the bell housing. And that would affect the thickness of the thrust washer, uh, thrust bearing uh, carrier. You've got the washer, you've got the bearing itself and it sits on a plastic carrier which slides up and down on the fork, the operating fork. Well this fork needs to come right forward before it starts to, to engage with the clutch fingers. It still works, I've tried it, I can operate the clutch, I've turned the engine over with the clutch in and first and let the clutch out and the car moves. So it's working and the clutch plate was directional and I did get it the right way round before anyone says anything. You um, Earlier on I mentioned the clutch could go either way, it can't. It only faces one way and it's usually marked on it, flywheel side. I didn't know that, I must have speed read the Hanes. I did read the Hanes before the clutch and I've missed that. Luckily, it was a 50-50 chance and I got it right by luck, not by me knowing what I'm doing. Uh, so the clutch is okay, it's just that the, the first bearing itself is probably needs to be a thicker type. But this might work and we could always make a bracket to stand this back. Paul also mentioned you could do that um, whilst it won't look stock factory. I don't think we're gonna be taking the gearbox out again just to do a thrust washer it's a new thrust washer although looking back on the video I just played it back before um, I've made this film today and it looked the right type indeed the one that came out was thinner and the one I put in was thicker so I just still don't know it could be that there's three types thin medium and, and, and full-on I don't know it's an interesting one one for the uh, the experts to inform me powers to the car of course fuel lines are connected spark plugs are in but they need nipping up now I mustn't forget to do that those HT leads can then be routed accordingly so there's quite a bit of a uh, multitasking going on but the first thing is to get this wiper situation out of the way and uh, so with that that job's done otherwise it just gets a bit chaotic in in the head I want to get them wipers running and the heater box back in and the heater matrix pipes fitted to the car okay that's what i'm going to do i'm going to do it that way around hope you agree with me on that pc project papa on a monday starting it all over again will it run unboxing video will it run videos i've got nothing to film videos okay wiper motor is out and the wiper motor the wiper arms are seized it's not the motor so the motor would have just been stuck trying to turn them unfortunately i wish i'd have spotted that but it, it might be okay these gearboxes always need to strip down anyway the, the grease is always drying them so we'll take it out them tens there and just have a quick check i won't take the cover off it i'll just take the gearbox cover off and unpack that grease and repack it because it always goes dry but i'll put 12 volts to it just to see if it runs it might have survived but the arms themselves here we are for the arms starting to go but look seized so what we need to do is get the bulldog penetrating spray spray liberally go to a place with loads of women and brace yourselves spray liberally what's this spray liberally business some people get it some people don't it's off a sitcom called bottom with rick mail and adrian edmondson and the episode i can't remember which one the episode it was in but it's uh, all to do with a spray spray liberally so we're gonna have to get these freed up so i'll go and get some lubrication now and i'll slowly start rocking them i'm gonna spray from the back spray from the top we're going to get them running really smooth it'll be the bushes the shaft bushes themselves that will have gone the collars there's a there's a um there's a uh, collar I'm trying to I need a right hand really to show you um there's a collar 
uh, yeah, there's a collar, and you need to get the sp there's the yeah, there it is. So we need to work that hard, and then that should come off and uh, work nicely. Let's get on with that. Today's lubrication of choice is Furtan. Actively dissolves the rust as you go. I'm out of Bulldog, so I've switched to Furtan, but I'm going to tell the stores to stock the Bulldog as well. Try and get that to go down the collar shaft. I'm touching it with a straw. Once that gets in, I have done this as a preemptive when I got the car, but it's obviously, I've not done it with enough attention to detail i've just done it briefly so when i get onto the linkages as well you can get to them here just literally it'll go in the end it'll it, this will definitely free up there's a double linkage bar that's a non-lubricated one it's a nylon setup this one here will need the torch to get in go blind Okay, and I'll work that now. Work it to the bone. Careful. They need both forces, really. Hey, that's starting to move, that one. My gimbal camera's gone. The gimbal's failed. Common fault on them. Osmos. Very sensitive gimbals. So I'm on this wide angle all the time at the moment. I'm going to get both hands on those. Right, we're going to strip this down. Stick these bolts back into the casing first. Before I strip it down, I'll put 12 volts to it. Could be uh, easier said than done. Let's have a look. I've got a look a hook up here. Hopefully, it'll turn and it's not burnt it out. It'll be my fault if it has burnt it out totally my fault I should have smelt it cooking when the ignition was on here's a battery it doesn't matter about the polarity it'll just it's been the opposite way for tests purposes here we go we're on survived it survived shows how robust these things are All right we can get into it's worth fixing now let's get this cover off there we go, there we go, I'll show you the dried up grease, now I bet because it's guana it's really dry. You'll find a little park system in here, actually, yeah it's bone dry, absolutely bone dry. This would not run as smoothly, your wiper action wouldn't be as good. There's, the grease is just caked um, what's left of it wiper contacts are good they can sometimes burn but they're good not too bad I think that's survived that's a they're very tough units these very rare to fail the only thing that usually goes on these is the worm drive there will strip and that white cog the big cog here will strip I'd imagine one day you'd get those remade these motors I've never known one actually go even the brushes in there they're pretty good I mean think about it and this indeed will help us now date the car because I'm just going to go a little bit I'm going to sedge way off the car um, stamp ID the, the VIN tag when I've traced it with tracing paper it looks like KA which would make it 70 and it's not a 70 car no way the only other thing it could be is XA and there's no such number on the on the four on the data sheets 
or MA which would make it March 72. Now we know it's a series one because of the face vents, the continuous face vents, they've not got the split face vents which they brought in later in 72, 73. I think it's a 72 car but I just don't know, I can't decode that VIN. Um, it's either KA, XA or MA. The most likely one is MA which would be would be March 72. Swampy is LU, L71. M goes to 72. N goes 73. I'm sure it does. Uh, so L for 71 because um, Ruby's LJ, Swampy's LU, 71 cars. This must be an early 72 car which needs to be January, February or March. But that's why I talk about this because this will be stamped. I've not looked at it yet. This will have a date on it. So it would expect that it would have a date no later than 72. So if it had a 73 date it would be wrong. So that 72 is there. So we asked to look at other things as well. But anyway, I digress. What I need to do is get this dried grease out of here and wonder if it's actually it's actually non-existent as opposed to dried. There's actually hardly any in there. So I'll put it in this bath. Oh boy, this is water stolen but let's clean the, clean the bath up. Let's get a, a mucky cough. I'll be right back. Stop recording. Clean this bath up here. And this is something I like to use, it's called Nurta Super Degreaser. It's good stuff, citrus based degreaser. Non fumy, water soluble, non harmful to marine life, good stuff. Put the motor in that, it won't do any harm at all. So I've seen that you don't need those test leads no more. Now, you're because you're on a wide angle lens, you're a bit further away than you'd normally be, simply because our cameras died. Our expensive Osmo camera is gone. I put it down to the fact that I'm using it on car resto work as opposed to creative film work. Big mistake because they're just not robust enough for that. This cog will come out, it lifts out, It'll probably come out easy once this is broke down. I'll clean the body as well. It's in good order. You can tell how rust free the car is by these clips on the side of the motor housing. They're galvanized or gold passivate and the gold passivate's not come off. Normally these are rusted. Just shows you the environment was kind to that kind of thing. Anyway, it wasn't kind to rubber though. A lot of rubber items are noticed on the car have um, completely perished and a lot of plastic items like the dashboard switches very brittle in the heat of course. Petrol tank didn't fare well, did it? That was uh, rotted from itself. I reckon there's a chemical reaction in the petrol tank to do with the fuel breaking down. It probably turned acidic and destroyed the tank. Although, I must admit, it didn't rot from the bottom. I wonder if that's the fumes that went acidic. We digress. That's uh, chemistry, but just cleaning the body up a little bit. You may as well while you're here. There's no point not doing it. For the sake of an extra 10 minutes work just so that everything that you handle is a little bit cleaner looks a bit more presentable and it's, a, it's a psychological thing as well you're sort of doing the best you can do obviously we're not going crazy we're just getting off the, the worst of it you'll see this is coming up a lot better There'll be some tarnishing on that alloy casting. I'm not worried about that. Just the grease I wanted off. There's a ceiling rubber there. That survived, that's supple. We're okay there. So the gears then. Still breaking down the grease now. It's packed right in there on that worm drive. There's the worm drive coming up a bit closer for you at home. And a contact plate. These are your self park. That's your what's called a sector, a wiper sector. You can see why they call it that. That circle there, that's a park area, self-parking. So there's 
some contacts here which will also clean up and the rest of the dried up grease those copper wipers there make contact onto that ring and they help the well they create the park system the self park system for the wipers so that they're always parked down at the bottom those can burn but they're okay tension on them looks all right one's a little less than the other so I'll just give it a little just to overcome some of the years a slight bit of extra tension on them won't do any harm not too much because they're obviously weighted they don't score the, the pads but um, they're okay it's a little bit can go a bit weak but they're all right that's clean that's clean I think the wheel lifts out I would need something to pick it I'm sure these just come up you see there's a locking circuit on there there could be this one might be locked in I've seen them without that clip curiously I think that's got a clip on it yeah it's all locked together I was sure they came out doesn't really matter because we'll get most of the grease what I might do with this is get compressed air in it now and blast it out because there'll be stuff behind the wheel as the pressure mode say I'll probably power it up to break down the rest of the grease Let's just give it a spin. Let's, let's get this car on the road, eh? Let's get this car on the road, eh? So, if there is any debris... Can you see that there? Just about. You can hear it, probably. I might be able to bring it up to you. A little bit crude, the way we're doing this on the battery about sorry for this crudeness you would normally have hookups on here can you see that so I'm letting that degreaser work its magic round there and let it dribble out So we're pretty clean there, looks clean now, smooth. I think what I'm tempted to do is put compressed air on this now and just finish it off. You may as well for the sake of just firing that compressor up now just to get the last of that out and it's totally clean. We'll be right back with this clean. Then we've got some multi-purpose grease just in the background. Don't need the fur time for this. I'd say the Nerta stuff was good. There you go if you want to look it up. This is, oh, I found this the best degreaser for the best price. Now then, it's saying, it is saying caustic actually. Let's just see. I'm seeing if it's English. Yeah, raw solvents, FCC salt, oil grease, rust removes bitumen. Let work in a couple of minutes. The warning on, is not really on there. I was sure this was water dissolvable, saying it's corrosive. Uh, eye damage. So it can be dangerous. So I take it back. Be careful with inerta. Okay. I take it back, but I'm sure it's waterable water dissolvable but I won't uh, give you the official on that you look it up yourself but all I'm telling you is it's a good degreaser okay so if I got that wrong I'm sorry right we'll be right back when we've blown this out see you in a sec stop recording okay I'm back and that's clean uh, for a, a 97,000 mile car I'd expect this to look a lot more worn than what it does 
you normally get score lines in them discs so you can get score lines in those in that disc there it looks like it hasn't done any work this now here's a here's a quiz for you, you want to type away if we're doing the live chat I don't know if this will be on live chat it should be why for a 97,000 mile car is the motor low new motor perhaps or is there another reason that's a quick trick question for you why is this motor in good order think about a clue is where's the car from type away first to get it wins a prize i'll give you a shout out on the next film grease now another thing i noticed as well the screen is minimally scratched okay some general purpose grease on a spatula and this is all you gotta do just goes in there like this and that's it that's packed you don't go crazy with it that's all it needs that's the only contact area there and the wipers don't require it so put that spatula in there to dissolve off good old common multi-purpose and now and now we can put the cover back on here's our cover dry it down careful when you're drying it not to catch the little delicate wipers contact wipers and then obviously make sure it is dry you don't want our degreaser to dissolve the grease we've just put in Could take it back to the I'm lazy so blasting it out this goes back on and that's that's all there is to it. it really is that easy move this for, so you can see a bit better I know you're far away because the way the lens is set up and the weather's shocking by the way the July Just so you can see. I'm just trying to give you the best viewing experience we can. Right, that is on. Did you get it? Why it's a low mileage unit? Anyone got it yet? Papa right we can put it into this this needs a bit of tlc too while you're on we're not going to go mental but let's just clean the inside of this out this is the the mounting plate for the bulkhead we want some rust kill on it we'll do that i'll show you that in a sec and these do have a weather strip on them we'll talk about that in a sec the weather's terrible. Do you know what? There was a 40 degree heat wave, which of course you'll know about if you live in the UK or some parts of Europe that were hot. And they had us, the media had us in a frenzy. Well, they tried to, didn't get me in one. They wanted us, they whipped up a frenzy about this uh, heat wave. It may have, uh, may be true about um, it's the hottest on record and stuff. But they really whipped up a frenzy about it. They really did. I remember the summer of 76 was uh, probably not as hot, but we just took it in our stride in them days. Although I must admit, to be accurate, I would like to get some press cuttings from 76 and see just how the media handled it in those days. Perhaps they did the same sensationalism as they did this time. People not going to work. Too hot to go to work. Now, come on. Come on. That's a sky, I bet you a million quid that anyone that didn't go to work because it was too hot was out in the garden, big time. Yeah, if it was radioactive outside, you couldn't go to work if, if the skies were radioactive and you wouldn't go in your garden if it was radioactive. But just because a bit of the sunshine, well, it is radiation, of course, but you know, not to go to work. Oh, come off it. I suppose if the air cons fail then there, maybe there are situations like that but but there will be genuine cases of course where you couldn't go 
but there'll be abuse big time of that so i'm not going in it's too hot yeah more like ap apathy and laziness <clears throat> there are other words stronger expletives i'd love to use on this channel but someone will just shock me and, re and report me because you know what the haters they still watch they can't they love it they love a bit of it the haters still watch they'll watch the whole film just to see if there's anything they can get the little claws into they love a bit of it oh they love a bit of it those haters they're the ones that are in the garden but yeah the weather a couple of days of hot sunshine and they go mental and then what what they do now when it's mediocre it's not exciting enough to report in the paper so they'll go and stick their snouts somewhere else indeed as i speak it started to rain a joke it's an absolute joke i've been doing this in the rain most most days now not heavy rain but it's uh, spitting right that's cleaner but i'll just put some rust killer on that i'm popping it back we ain't concourse in this bad boy a pop where'd you stop otherwise right okay we'll be right back we're gonna install this now i won't film that we've had enough on this little little uh papa ramble see you in a sec pc cortina city stop recording i tell you what it's very nasty in here let's get away from that state this was <laughs> very nasty in there let's get henry on henry probably the best hoover probably the best vacuum cleaner ever invented henry <laughs> areas hidden by the heater box and it's actually a plenum would you believe and by plenum it's a chamber for air to to enter normally a, a different air, uh, air pressure so in this case the plenum is the air intake grill for fresh air to get into the fresh air vent which is this one to the right hand side of the of the bulkhead there's two openings one to let hot air through after it's been through the heater matrix in the heater box the other one direct airflow and ram air as well if the fan's not running from the grill here into the scuttle so scuttle down into this plenum now <clears throat> that plenum needs to be airtight if it's not then it gets fumes from the engine into it so if you've got a leaky exhaust, if you've got a burning engine, the first place you're going to get the fumes coming into the cabin aren't the windows at the side, but that fresh air vent and the hot air vent there. Because what happens is this, the heater box, which is removed in this case for now, for this explanation, the heater box is out, we'll put a different one in. The heater box draws its fresh air from this complete chamber. And in order for it to work properly, the chamber has to be air tight or hermetically sealed from the engine bay and the only way of air getting into this this ch chamber this this um compartment is through the scuttle and by air going through the scuttle you're mu much li less likely to have the fumes coming in from the engine bay because the car's passing through the airflow the airstream and it's fresh air now what happens is the problem is is the seals go each component that fits in there its backing face is sealed airtight against the bulkhead so starting in this corner the little triangular plate that goes in that should have a foam seal but the foam breaks down especially in this country the, this hot climate that this car has been in the foam breaks down you lose that airtight seal and you've now got fumes able to find their way in to that compartment and it's not as fresh air as you'd want the other areas the wiper motor itself also is sealed because it makes one complete run and the heater box as well heater box is the most common place for the air to get through because the nature of the heater box is it's hard to get it tight up against the bulkhead 
and the seal on them was never really that great so we're going to replace those seals with some simple stick on foam cut into strips and ad uh, adhesive backing stuck to the back of the parts that we're putting back in whilst we are not putting in all refurbished parts we're just doing you know light service work on them to keep costs down but what we're doing is making that it's, it's going to be functional and it's going to work as it should it's just cosmetically not up to what we would do when we've done the concourse rebuild so the first thing uh, is to get that clean which we've just backed out with henry second thing is to see if there's any rust under there it's a very difficult area to weld the reason is that if you, if you did have a hole there and you needed to weld it the whole dash has got to come out because the soundproof mattings behind there the wiring harnesses behind there you need the car stripped to do repairs on this at least for the majority of it anyway you might get away with it if you were ingeni in, ingeniously uh, come up with a way of getting the dash out uh, locally you know in woods if it was that side you might say well I can get the glove box out I can put wet towels behind there whatever and uh, do a, a weld patch possibly but typically it's always this lower lip here that goes and you can see it started on this one I'll bring you in now it's time for you to come in and have a look little break and I'll bring you right in hold on stop recording okay so coming in for that common rot area and the one that kills the cortinas this is what kills them so you can see on this car this is a good example so there's a lot worse if you look at my early videos you can see it's started to attack it here it's trying to go there where that water channel collects and then all the way down as well it's having it go it hasn't got through this car's solid but you left that long enough pound to a penny that'll rot and and the hardest bit right up in this corner right back up there is where you'd blast your wax oil big time so that's what we're going to do we're going to load the gun up and we're going to lever this absolutely but we're going to use the 3125 or the 3126 can never remember what not the ml spec dinner troll this is the dinner troll that's surface mounted design it's a spray on spray spray, spray surface on as opposed to something that's going to creep between the panels there's no real cavities here for it to creep into but we're basically talking about a surface protection so we're going to blast it on we'll have to wire wheel out here because some, some dried on crud in fact actually i'm just going to go very carefully with a wire brush because what i don't want to do is take off any unnecessary paint so that's an area it's, it's got to be done and i know i'm trying to get the engine running but i want this out of the way you can see how the water has been running down there and that's how it rots look how it collects in this area that's the problem that you get and um, they did have a plenum droop, droop a plenum drain tube the plenum drain tube lands here and it's a tube that fits well actually goes through the heater box uh, a little bit it actually lands around this area and it's a tube that diverts the water down that way they got rid of it because it blocked up and the water was backing up um, from what I can read in, remember reading on a tech bulletin, there's a whole bit of info, might be wrong, but I'm sure it got discontinued because it didn't work, it blocked. And rather have water come out and block up with leaves, they just didn't have it at all. Leaves do get in here, that's the thing, and the leaves turn to mulch, the mulch then traps the moisture and you're rotting. So that's an area if you've got a cortina which I'd be looking at to try and prevent any further rust. You've probably by now got something starting. You'll be very lucky if you haven't. You've probably had a dry stored low mileage car that's never seen any weather. Good on you. But a lot of us are out there in the elements and this is uh, under attack. Leaves getting in there is a big thing. I think if you can get them out and then you, you know that stops a lot of the retention and the contact rotting that it, that happens in there so we're going to clean that up now and then i'll dinner troll it then i'll put the motor back together then i shall then get the other heater box and fit that but we need that backing foam on so we get that airtight seal as we explained how that plenum system works and then all along we're trying to get the engine running so we are flat out here at the city pc on the controls pc on the camera thanks to the patreons youtubers and the paypalers Without Patreon, there would be no videos. Uh, some people say on YouTube, have you abandoned us? 
on YouTube. Well, not so much that as uh, this costs money, and the only thing that keeps it going is Patreon. Although I must say, that could sound rude to people who are only on YouTube, so I do apologise if it sounds that way, because I know that you donate in the chat boxes, so I'm not meaning it that way. I'm saying YouTube in general, in principle, don't pay enough. It's YouTube's fault. They don't pay enough for the views. That's the problem with it. That's why a lot of people have got Patreon channels now, because they've realised that, the, the, you know, there's no money train, there's no there's no gold gold mine there in YouTube anymore. If indeed there ever was, maybe very early on stages when the market wasn't saturated. There's a lot of car restorations we appreciate. You've got other car video uh, shows that you can watch. We appreciate you've chosen Cortina City for your choice in car restoration today. We hope you have a good onward flight. Don't forget any overhead luggage that might be check under your seats before you go. Mobile phones slipping down the backs of the seats. Watch out! And uh, weather over the Bay of Biscay, 23 degrees. Uh, we'll be right back to so Cortina City. Well, we're lucky with this one. We've caught it in time. There's no significant rot through on this bulkhead. There would have been, and it was having a go, it was starting to crust up, so I took all that crustiness off, and now it's got a treatment on top of it, an over-primable treatment, a rust-killing treatment on top. Attacks the rust first, and you can over-paint it as well. I'll show you what that is. That is this stuff. It's Dinatrol, Rust Converter, Amber, and you can over-paint it. Where does it say overpaint? Rust convert and primer. So that is what we've put in those places there. Okay. Then uh, some zinc goes on as well, and then we can close everything up and wax all on top of that. But that that has to be done. It's going to be there in the post. The rot will will be in the post, waiting to come to your door if you don't get on and stop that quickly. PC Cortina City on my one hour express heater box restoration section of the Papa video. We talked about that plenum area under the skull to stop fumes getting into your car and to make fresh air flow much more purely, not mixing with engine fumes, which you get if you don't replace these seals here. Now, We've gone into stores and dragged out another heater box. It looked rough, but we've managed to do a one hour express, express restoration on it. Now, people are asking why didn't you use Papa's one? I've mentioned it so many times. It hasn't got the hot air diverter flap built in because it was for export. Papa was for South America, was built to go to South America. So on the production line at the factory, they would have picked a Delon Air hot climate unit, which is basically exactly the same, but it just doesn't have the, the flap inside to divert hot air through the heater matrix. So rather than take Papa's apart, it seemed a shame because these do crumble when you try and take them to bits. They just fall to pieces. I found one in store, so I was lucky. So what I've done, I'll give it a quick one hour refurb. I've gone over it with thinners. So just gun thinners and a brush to get the, uh, the crud off it because it's gentle with a brush, you can't really do anything else. Then air gummed it down with the uh, compressed air so that these spaces here that I'm about to attach the self-adhesive strip to, the foam strip, are grind free and this will adhere much better. It's got little guide channels for this to go in. This is just, this is actually Dynamat type stuff, but it works the cell. It's closed cell, it works the same. It's closed cell, so it won't, Deteriorate the water, hopefully. Cut an angle on that one. That goes in there like this. That completes the circuit. So now what we've got is a, a sponge backing pad all the way around the back of the heater. And you can see this hole here is where the, hot, the cold air is drawn in to the squirrel cage fan. Here is the skull. There's the skull intake and that's that plenum we've just been looking at so that's how you replace the seal there you cut you can buy this on the sheet or you can buy it in strips but this stuff is actually what i got from um i got this from martrim m-a-r-t-r-i-m and it's actually a soundproofing material but it works 
as a sponge as well. Now, there's some damage on this heater box, but not a great deal. Remember, it's not a concourse restoration, this. So, we've gone over it with... What have you found in there, lad? What are you digging at? What are you digging at? I'm gonna get it in the right mess. <laughs> 